In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, uh, allow us now to invest ourselves into your holy word again for this hour. Make it a sacred time and a sacred experience um, where we are enriched by the conversation, by the text, of course, most of all by the lessons, the spiritual lessons, the Spirit himself, who I trust will come to us through our prayerful consideration of these scriptures. I ask you, Lord, let them just come alive to us in a new way, in an important way that will enrich our lives, especially in the ways that help us to serve you better and our fellow man. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. So last week we had a consideration of an introduction to the Exodus. A little bit of the background. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. A little bit of the background and uh, trying to situate it in time and in the scriptures. Just very, very briefly, it is the second book in the Pentateuch or the Torah, the Ha Torah, which means the law, the first five books of the Bible. Um, they come to us from deep, rich, central part of the Jewish tradition. This second book, the Exodus, deals with an event that is really the defining event of the Jewish religion. Uh, the Exodus from Egypt is as important to the Jewish history and religion and understanding of God as the incarnation of Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection is to our understanding of the Christian faith. Okay, we're right at the heart of the matter. Exodus picks up a story that is told from Genesis through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All right, this is just part of that story. And it picks up exactly where Genesis left off. Genesis left off with uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who renamed Israel, are in the Promised Land. Israel has 12 sons. During the time of Israel and his 12 sons, there is a great famine. Jacob, his youngest son, has been sold into slavery in Egypt, where God has taken care of him, and he's risen to a position of great power. He's actually in charge of the granaries and the food that has been stored up in Egypt because of uh, Joseph's interpretation, prophetic interpretation of a dream that was given to Pharaoh. Because of that, his brothers, the, 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 the other 11 sons of Israel, have come to Israel, have to come to Egypt, where he invites them to stay. At the end of the, at the, of the book of Genesis, Israel himself, Jacob, dies. They take him back and bury him in the Holy Land. And in the very end of Genesis, Joseph himself dies. But he makes his brothers promise that when God takes you from this land back to the promised land, promise me you and your descendants will take my bones with you. Right? He is mummified and buried, and that's the end of Genesis. Now here we are 400 years later. The Israelites are still in Egypt. Now, they were given a very choice province to live in. I mean, the, the, the very finest land. And I've shared with you that possibly this dovetails with what archaeology tells us is the era, the empire of the Hyksos, which were not really Egyptians. They were sort of a Canaanite hybrid group that history tells us had moved into this region and were strong enough that they almost had their own autonomy, right? But eventually, the pharaohs of Egypt took it over. And so here we are now where that has happened. Pharaoh now controls Goshen, this province, and he has become uh, worried about the Hebrews that live there because they have grown in such great number. They're not loyal to Pharaoh. They're not loyal to the Egyptian way. They worship their own god, not the <coughs> Egyptian pantheon. And, he's, and it's going to tell us here, he becomes worried that if we're ever invaded from the east, they may join forces against us, right? So he has made a decision that says he doesn't know anything about Joseph uh, or the promises made to him or this history of how Joseph saved the land. He doesn't care about it. He cares about the here and now. And so they decide to enslave the Hebrews. Now, our, our understanding of, of slavery 
you know, is the grueling poverty and terrible conditions of perhaps the, uh, the slaves in the South uh, in, a, in, a, in a bad part of American history, or maybe the slaves in the Roman era. These seem to be treated a little bit better than that. They have relations, friendly relations with their neighbors, it seems. They have their own homes still. And yet they're forced into laboring as Pharaoh commands, which is mainly building the, uh, uh, a couple of the cities that were under construction at that time. And I'm going to go with the era here is about 1450. 1450 is the time of the Exodus. So we're a little bit before that, maybe the year 1500 BC. Others will disagree with that dating, maybe put it two, three hundred years later. I want to take an aside. <laughs> and I want to tell you a story, though, that just comes to my mind. And it's, and it's one of the many stories that happen for people who are carefully reading the scriptures and they see things that maybe aren't readily apparent, but it's way that the big story of the scriptures weave together. All right? Remember, the books of the Bible were written by different people in different times, very different cultures, sometimes even different languages. And yet there's like golden threads, I think, that run through them that bind them all together. Here's one. It doesn't have that much to do with Exodus, but a little bit. It's included too. So when Jacob, Israel, is about to die, he gathers his 12 sons together, and they are going to ask for his final blessing, right? And that's recorded in Genesis 2. His favorite son, who will get the double portion blessing of the firstborn, is given to Joseph, even though he's number 11. Because he's the firstborn of his, the wife he loves, which is Rebecca. This is part of the problem Joseph had with his brothers. <laughs> All right, but Joseph says, Father, what I would like you to do is to take my blessing and give it to my two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. All right? And Joseph does that. So really, when they list the 12 tribes, Joseph is not usually named from hereafter. It's 13 tribes because they have Ephraim and Manasseh. Okay? We haven't gotten to it yet, but you know what's going to happen with the golden calf, right? In a, in a number of chapters, in a couple of weeks, we're going to get to where the great apostasy, where Moses is coming down from Mount Sinai, the great event where God is going to make them his covenanted people and give them the terms, which begin with the Ten Commandments. He finds that while he was gone for 40 days, they think he's gone forever, we've got to go to plan B, and they have Aaron make them a golden calf, and they're worshiping it. One of the gods of Egypt. Amron, I think his name was. Remember that. Hundreds of years now into the future. We have the kingdom of David in the year 1000 B.C., maybe 400 years after this, 500. He goes to war and finally is the one who establishes peace on all the borders of Israel. It's at its most expanded version ever, and there's peace on all the borders. He spends his whole life in war. His son Solomon then takes the, the throne, okay? He's able to concentrate on other things besides war. And he accumulates great wealth. I mean, arguably the Mac Daddy nation in the whole world as they knew it at that time. Um, and he builds the temple. He builds the temple. And that temple costs Israel a lot. And also, not just in money, but he, I don't know if it's forced labor, but he employs the Israelites to build this temple. Okay? And it's hard work, but they're probably very willing to do it because they get the temple, right? It's going to be their temple. When Solomon dies, his kingdom goes to his son, Rehoboam, or Rehoboam. I'm not sure which is the right way to say it. The people come to him and say, look, we're willing to serve you, Rehoboam, except this. Solomon was a great king and we loved him, but he really was hard on us. Now that the, the temple is built, back up a little bit. 
on this forced labor campaign. Back up a little bit on this heavy taxation. Re 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 Rehoboam goes to the senior advisors that used to advise his father and say, what do you think my response should be? And they say, do it. Do it, and they'll love you and serve you forever. And we'll go on to bigger and better things as a nation. Then he goes and consults the young men he grew up with. His frat brothers. He said, what do you guys think I should do? And they said, oh, no. They'll just think you're weak, right? You need to show them who's boss early on, you know, and keep them in check. You can't have the riffraff, these deplorables, thinking like they have any, any uh, status or rights, okay? You're, in, you're, the, you're, the, you're the man. And that's what he does. He basically says, no, I'm going to make it even harder on you than Solomon did. They rebel. They rebel. The ten northern tribes, as we call them, rebel, and they separate from really the three southern tribes. Remember, there's 13 nations, 13 tribes. Judah, which is where Jerusalem was, Benjamin, a small region which is really encompassed by Judah, and the Levites. The Levites were not given a territory. Because after the golden calf, God made that one tribe the priests. He said, from now on, you're going to be the priests, because they were the ones that stood with Moses and didn't enter into the golden calf worship. Okay? Really a punishment. But they were not given a territory. They, were not, they didn't have to shepherd and raise crops to exist. The people were going to offer tributes to the temple and support them. Okay? So really you had those three tribes in the south around Judah and, and, and Rehoboam. And uh, then you had the ten northern tribes that went into rebellion and separated. They decide they want as their king, Jeroboam. I've got to back up a little bit. Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, had an Egyptian mother. Joseph Mary found a wife in Egypt. Right? So they had an Egyptian mother. All right. Jeroboam is from the tribe of Ephraim. He's gone into exile because Solomon and Rehoboam suspect him of being dangerous, which he was. He goes into exile where, do you think? He's in Egypt. He's in Egypt. He's got Egyptian blood. They go to him and say, come back and be our king. So he says, okay. He comes back. He sets up his own capital in Samaria. And what he quickly realizes, and we can read about this in... Uh, 1 Kings, chapter 12 and 13. You can read about it yourself. 1 Kings, chapter 12 and 13. But he realizes, look, the people all have their hearts still in Jerusalem. That's where the temple is. They're still going there for the festivals. They still recognize that as where God lives, the God they worship. I can't have that or I won't be able to hold their allegiance. So he said, I'm going to set up our own temple. He sets up two of them, one in Bethel and one way up in the most northern regions, uh, which, which is Dan, the province of Dan. He appoints his own priests, not Levites. Anybody who wanted to be a priest, basically, and I guess if they had a few shekels, he would make them a priest. So he had his own priesthood, he had his own, now two temples they could go to and worship. And he said, but we have to have something for them to worship. So he made for them, <laughs> can you guess? He made two golden calves. Put one in each of the new temples, the little temples he wrote, and says, Israel, here's your God, the God that led you out of Egypt. The same thing that Aaron said to the Israelites, right? There in the desert, nothing new under the sun. And, and I don't know, I, I told you it was an aside, but it's just a little bit of, of linkage, I think, to the story that's at hand. And I think it speaks to the ongoing concupiscence that's in people. Because the people went for it. They said, okay, new priesthood, new kingdom, new king, new gods. Isn't it something? 
And that's all I have to say about it. <laughs> I, didn't, I had no more purpose in telling you that story except it's something. So now you know. The book of Exodus, chapter 1. This thing is going to move very rapidly because we're going to start with the, first this history, then the birth of Moses. And by the time we get to chapter 3 or so, Moses is going to be 80 years old. He's already grown up. He's already gone into exile. He'll be married. He'll have a kid. He'll be living in Midian. And God's going to call him to the burning bush. And that's really where our story is going to begin. So we're going to move kind of quickly here. Chapter 1, verse 1. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Then he named them. Reuben, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the offspring of Jacob. And there were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. We know all that. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the descendants of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the sons of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war befalls us, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens, and they built for Pharaoh's store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they <coughs> spread abroad. Stop here. Why did it have to be this way? God had promised the Holy Land to the descendants of Abraham. 400 years, or more than that now, 500 years later or more, they're now in Egypt, in Goshen. Is that the promised land? And they're slaves. Why? Have you noticed that God rarely writes with a straight line? He's going to get from A to B, but it's rarely a straight line. He gets you there his way. But why? I mean, I think we're allowed to use our imagination here. Let's just don't say that's the way it is, and so be it. I mean, did God forget? Was he being mean? What would have been the purpose of doing it this way in your imagination? Ron? He gives people choices, and he hopes they'll make a choice that he wants them. A lot of times they don't. And sometimes he has to help them make the right choice. That's good. All right, he wanted them to go to Goshen to escape the drought, the famine. But why did he send the drought and the famine? Why did he want them for 400 years out of the Holy Land? Did I ask a harder question? <laughs> you just blew it. I just yeah. blew it for you. Um, I was just thinking that maybe he needed them to get a new respect for him. Maybe so. That's true. But what happened in the 400 years they were gone? They dispersed. They broke apart. They... No, they stayed together. But they're in Goshen. It, but they fractured themselves. Um, they didn't have the faith. No, they weren't formed yet in the faith as they will know it after Mount Sinai. So, so we'll, we'll look at what they have at this point in just a second. But I still want to know... What did we just read happen to them while they were in Goshen during those 400 years? They multiply. There's tons of them. Okay? We're going to read when they leave, the narrative says, we can argue or not, but let's go with it, 600,000 men. Probably 2 million people. Probably as many people in Goshen as there were in all of Egypt. No wonder they were worried about them, right? Do you think the local Canaanites would have allowed them to grow that large back in Canaan? Because back when Abraham was there, they had some tension, but by and large, nobody tried to wipe them out because they were just a small tribe of nomads. Right? Relatively harmless. But I'm just supposing 
What if they got to where there's a few thousand of these guys? Right? Or more. Local Canaanite kings might have been getting a little nervous. And they might have said, we got this ragtag group of gypsies that are multiplying in our midst, right on our borders. I don't like it. Do you, king so-and-so? I don't like it either. Let's see if other king, Wadawa, let's all get together and let's maybe nip this thing in the butt. I'm just one. Tom? Maybe, I was thinking maybe the fact that they were relatively comfortable with those, okay, and they became lackadaisical and everything, and they even thought they could go into this step. Really, you like it. Well, you're, a, you're a step, probably two steps ahead of me, but you're right. So he says, no, I want you to multiply in a place where you won't be wiped out. So I'm going to take you to Egypt, and I'm going to give you a place that you like. So you're not going to be eager to leave. They liked it in Goshen. They're liking them apples, right? Here we got a place of, another place of milk and honey, really. We got... We've got the choicest farmland. We've got plenty of water. We're comfortable. We're getting along. Who wants to go back to the desert? Who wants to roam around chasing sheep all the time? So we got, we got a very comfortable place. They really didn't have a motivation to go back, did they? Right? Just like you said. Until later. <laughs> but now the motivation to go back is to escape slavery. So God, yes, imposed on them now an irritation that makes them maybe open to moving if it comes up, if the opportunity comes up. Is this where they destroyed the blood babies as well? Yeah, we're about to get to that. We're half a second away. Thank you. I love it. I can't hold you back. Biting at the bit. But I'm just trying to answer the question, so why, why did this happen? How did we get here in the plan of God? Because now when they leave, and 40 years later, they end up on the border to the Holy Land, they're a force to be reckoned with. All right? Aren't they? Now when he says, take the land I've given to you, 600,000 men, that's an army. That's the biggest army in the land. Right? I'm just saying. So now, that couldn't have happened 400 years earlier. Just what Jay thinks about when he's driving around sometimes out in the country. I'm just putting that out to you because if that question occurred to you, this is how I'm, this is the box I'm putting it in for right now. And they may have never left Goshen if they had not been enslaved. And even then they didn't think they could. How do we get out? All right? So now we have a people who don't like slavery, though later on they're going to think it's not as bad as living in the desert. Maybe we should go back. That's going to preach volumes, I think, to us. So now we have the story continue. <laughs> so 400 years later, there's gazillions of them, but they no longer have a cushy life because they've been pushed into service to build the store cities. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, because they still continue to grow in number. They're working all day, but that's not enough to keep them from having babies. They're still having lots of them, right? The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua. Just two of them for all those people. When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, he shall, she shall live. So maybe he wasn't trying to wipe out the whole generation. But he has a couple of midwives out there cutting the numbers down and thinking this isn't going to be as outward as me just sending my men in and killing the boys, right? The midwives are going to have some time alone with a newborn baby, and the survival rate of newborns was not that impressive then. So if you had a few more that didn't make it, they can kind of go without suspicion. But if it's a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. But let the male children live. There's a footnote down here I think is cool. Shifra and Puah, the names of these heroines, 
and defenders of life, their names are preserved in the Bible, while the name of the mighty Pharaoh isn't even mentioned. I like that. I, I just wrote cool up by the by that. <laughs> the great insight. They wouldn't do it. All right? And God remembers their name forever in the scriptures. All right. He said, then he calls him in and he comes. He's on to him. He says, why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous. And they're delivered before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them family. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Does this remind you of any story in the Gospels that we know about? Forever in the New Testament, we're trying to compare Jesus to Moses. This is the story of Moses as a baby. Are we seeing a parallel here? The great king feared Jesus, the birth of Jesus to the point he sent his men out into the region around Bethlehem and said just slay them all boys two years old and younger Pharaoh's kind of doing the same thing throw them into the knot now a man will know later on his name is Amram from the house of Levi he's a Levite when it took to wife a daughter of Levi her name is Jochebed This is probably about the year 1500, 1525 or so B.C. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. She didn't want to throw him in the Nile. She didn't want anybody to throw him in the Nile. Now we're going to find out later on they already had two children. This is Moses who's just been born. He's got two older siblings. One is Aaron and the other is Miriam. Right? So he's baby number three. When she could no longer hide him, she took, for him a, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. And she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds at the river's bank. He's in the Nile, but she wants to at least give him a chance, right? I guess it's better than nothing. How hard. And his sister, Miriam, stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. But the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to fetch it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children, probably by the blanket or the swaddling clothes that he had on. Hebrew. His sister, who just happened to be there, said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the child went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me and I will give you your wages. So now she's allowed to have her baby in her home with Pharaoh's daughter's own permission. Nobody's going to harm him. So the woman took the child and nursed him, which I think back then was for quite a long time. Right? Two or three years? Is that right? How hard it would have been to give him away. The end of that. But at least he's alive. But that's what she did. The child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh. He became her son. And she named him Moses, which is a name that is Egyptian, but it also has a Hebrew connotation. I have down here, it's Egyptian for he who is born, Mose. But it's also a Hebrew word, Moshe, which means to draw out. Masha also, recalling his retrieval out of the night. She says, because I drew him out of the water. One day when Moses had grown up, he's now 40 years old. <laughs> we just hyperlinked, right? We just hyperlinked it. He's 40 years old. Now, does he know he's Hebrew? I think so. I think he knows he's Hebrew. Here's a question. 
while he was with his real mother, was he circumcised? It's going to come to question later on. What do you think? I don't know. Because the Egyptians didn't circumcise at eight days. That's one of the things these, these Israelites had. They had this tradition passed down to them that their ancestor Abram, who was renamed Abraham, had a theophany, a vision, an experience with God where he made him promises to go to Canaan and that eventually he would give that land to his descendants. They also know that he was to circumcise all of the descendants on the eighth day. Do they know much more than that? Well, they know they're tw they evidently kept up with which tribe of the 12 sons they were derived from. They don't seem to have much more than that at this point. And they did have circumcision. So was Moses circumcised on the eighth day? Maybe so, but the Egyptians circumcised too, but on the 13th year. So Moses would have been circumcised either way, I guess, by this point. He's 40 years old. You say, why are you hung up on that? You'll see. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people, looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man that did the wrong, Why do you strike your fellow? And he answered, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. I'm wondering, was this the guy he saved yesterday? <laughs> Ratting him out? Unless there was somebody who saw it at a distance, the only other person there that knew what he did was the guy he saved his bacon. And now the next day he resents him because he grew up in privilege, as people tend to do. Hebrew, but he looks more like an Egyptian to me. He's now an Egyptian prince, adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, destined for great things. Who does he think he is? Oh, yeah, he saved me yesterday, but he's still one of them, right? But Moses became afraid, and he thought, surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. I brought a little map. I don't know how well it's going to turn out. This is the Sinai Peninsula. Israel's up here. See where it says Canaan? That's the Dead Sea. Virtually up there is all of the land that we know the Gospels took in. Okay, we're Jerusalem and Galilee and all the rest. Way out of our map. This is Egypt. This is Goshen. This is sort of the border of Egypt. So Goshen is on the eastern border. Ramses and Pithon. I think most of the other cities that you can name there, you can take it or leave it. We really don't know where most of those places are. This is the map that's in our guide. People can test every detail of it <laughs> nowadays, including is this really Mount Sinai, where it was? Modern day Cairo is about right here. This is the Gulf of Suez. This is the Red Sea down here. Okay? This is the Gulf of Suez. This is the Gulf of Aqaba. And the two sides of those make up the peninsula, which is Sinai. Nowadays, that is controlled by Egypt, but it's kind of a, 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 a no-man's land, supposedly patrolled by UN troops, infested by uh, terrorists and other camps. You know, it's kind of a Wild West area now. Uh, the Egyptians will go in every now and then and clean up hotbeds of troublemakers. But this is the buffer zone between Egypt and Israel. The Gaza Strip is right here. So you hear about the tunnels that go into the Gaza Strip. Well, that's going to be coming from Sinai into uh, Gaza Strip, which is right here. The Suez Canal was dug to connect the northern end of the Gulf of Suez with the Bitter Lakes. It's really, it's really more than one lake. There's a series of lakes and some marsh there through that and then up to the Mediterranean Sea. That would be built in uh, 1860, I think it is. Pretty remarkable, that early. They built it, and it was so that ships didn't have to go all, coming from Asia, India, etc., and going to Europe or even to America, didn't have to go all the way around the Horn of Africa. They could come up and go through the, the uh, Suez Canal into the Mediterranean. It saved them a lot of, a lot of time, a lot of uh, fuel and uh, 
in danger too. Okay, so that's why it was dubbed. Has anyone ever seen Lawrence of Arabia? One of my favorite movies. Peter O'Toole, his first role, I think. Come, raise your hand. Am I speaking to just a, okay, a lot of you? All right, you remember in the movie, now Lawrence was a British soldier. It's World War I. All of this area is controlled by the Ottoman Empire. But at the time of this movie, the British have taken back Egypt, and they are at their headquarters in Cairo. Well, Lawrence is, is, is uh, he's sent to work with the Arabs, the Bedouins, the nomads in Syria and Jordan and Saudi Arabia, I guess, too, who were allied with Britain against the Turks, okay? And, and Lawrence, one of the problems they had was being able to supply these Arab allies because everything, every way to get to them was through Turkish-controlled land. They thought, well, the Gulf of Aqaba would be great, except that the Turks controlled Aqaba, which was a city right at the tip of it. This movie coming back to you? So Lawrence has this idea, if I could get, I think it was 50 brave Arabs to travel with me through this forbidden Sahara. I remember in the movie they called it the Devil's Amble. He said, no man can go through there. He says, well, maybe we can. Because if we can go through there and we can convince the Arab nomads that protect the Turks' rear flank, they're paid to do that, that live in this area, to join us, we can attack Aqaba from the rear. Because right now, the British couldn't enter it because the Turks had put these big guns in that were trained out to the ocean. Couldn't be turned, but they could certainly blow any ship out of the water. So Lawrence had this, man, I'm really going off here, haven't I? So Lawrence has this um, idea, and he succeeds. So they take Aqaba, and, and, and he decides, I need to let Cairo know. There's no cell phone. There's no... So he said, the only way I can let Cairo know, it's now open, we've got it, is, is to, I need to get to Cairo. And so he takes his two young cohorts, and in this dramatic part of the movie, they travel through, they go from Aqaba to Cairo, traveling through this terrible desert, you know, and they have sandstorms, and one of the kids drowns in a quicksand, right? And at the end of it, they're just about dead, dying of thirst and exhaustion. They stumble upon the Suez Canal. There's water, and there's this great big ship going by, and they're rescued. Putting it in context. <laughs> Does that help you at all? If you saw the movie and you remember those scenes, that's where we're at right there, okay? So, Goshen. When we get there, they're going to leave from here, and there's going to be, some people say the Mount, Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb, the same thing, must be pretty close because they just, that many people couldn't have moved that far in that short of time. There's, there's arguments for that, and there's problems. Traditionally, the Mount Sinai is down here, and I'll tell you why when we get there, maybe later. More recently, people are saying, no, it's in, it's in Saudi Arabia. This is northwest Saudi Arabia right here. Jordan up here, Saudi Arabia here. Uh, no, it's here. And maybe we'll go over a little of that. that. I've been watching YouTubes and reading books, and I'm just totally torn. So, uh, all right, so you know where we're at geographically, too. Mo I brought that up because we just read that when Moses flees, he goes out of Egypt. This is no place to live. Where does he go? Midian. Midian, on the far side of the Gulf of Aqaba. Okay? The Jordan's way up here. Yeah, no, Jordan River's not in play here at all. Uh, he didn't have to cross any body of water if he went this way. Okay? Now, we're going to have a problem of the Israelites are going to be crossing a body of water. They're going to call it the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds, but we don't know which body of water that is. So that's another problem. Not only where is Mount Sinai, but, but some people say, well, it's the Bitter Lakes. Some people say it was the northern end of the uh, uh, Gulf of Suez. Other people say, no, it's over here crossing the Gulf of Aqaba somewhere. And there's evidence, I guess you might say, for all of them and problems with all of them. We don't know, but we'll get there when we get there. Right now, I just want you to know that Moses is now in Midian. <clears throat> Did I tell you last time who Midian was? Midian was a son of Abraham. That after Sarah died, when he was 135 years old, he married again. Keturah. He had six more kids. And one of them is Midian. So his descendants 
now occupy this area, this kingdom, all right? And they're going to receive Moses okay. Let me show you why. Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. And they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Shepherds came and drove them away, treated them roughly, rudely. They're fighting over the water. They don't want to wait to feed their flock. But Moses stood up and helped them. Moses must have been, you know, much a man, right? All right, he took them on. Helped them water his flock. He also had a real heart, maybe he got out of hand sometimes, for the weak and the oppressed. You know, beating up some shepherds, one thing, he did kill that Egyptian. <coughs> Stood up and helped them and watered their flock. When they came to their father, Ruel, who later is going to be called Jethro, same guy, he said, how is it that you have come so soon today? They said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hands of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, and where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. Moses was content to dwell with the man. How could he be content to dwell with this man? Well, number one, we don't know how loyal of an Israelite Moses was. We don't know how much he knew about the traditions of the other lights, Israelites knew about. He grew up in Pharaoh's court, right? One thing, but even if he did, how would he tolerate living in the house of a pagan priest? Was he a pagan priest? Who did I tell you Midian was descended from? Abraham. So if Midian is the priest worshiping the God of Abraham, it's Moses is God, right? It's the Hebrew God. Maybe don't know him by the same name. Maybe they don't not operate on the same promises. But they're worshiping, worshiping him as God, which was right. Okay? Moses, he gave, uh, 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 Jethro gave Moses his daughter Zipporah, a Midianite. He's married to a Midianite. She bore him a son. His name is Gershom. Later on, he'll have another one named Eliezer. And he'll say, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. I guess that's what Gershom means. In the course of those many days, the king of Egypt died. The sons of Israel groaned under their bondage and cried out for help. And their cry under bondage came up to God. The time is right. 400 years they've now multiplied greatly. They've been under oppression long enough that they're tired of Goshen, no matter how nice it is. They're ready for a deliverer, and Pharaoh, the one that wanted to kill Moses, is gone so Moses will now be ready to go back. God's sitting up there waiting for all this to happen, just like a master baker. Everything's cooked to perfection, and so now we're going to have it. And God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant. That doesn't mean he ever forgot it. It just means the time is now. Okay? That covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. What was that covenant promise? What, what, what did he promise them? To give the Holy Land, Palestine, to their descendants. He's remembering it. Right? And God saw the sons of Israel and knew their condition. So here we go. Where the whole story really begins. Moses is now 80 years old. In two chapters, he's been born. Now he's 80. Lived 40 years in exile in Midian. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness. To me, that means he's somewhere in here. This is where he's going to have the encounter of the burning bush on the mountain of God, where God is going to say, I want you to bring the Israelites back to this mountain. So what kind of puts the problem with Mount Horeb being over here somewhere. Or maybe some people say, oh no, well, Moses had brought the, the flocks all the way over to here looking for good pastures. Probably 150 miles long way. But maybe so. Anyway, he's, on this, he's at this place. And he came to Horeb, the mountain of God, which is in Midian. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning. 
yet it was not consumed. A little footnote down here I also thought was cool. On the 3 verse 2, the very end of that paragraph. It's written by St. Gregory of Nyssa in a book he wrote called The Life of Moses. He said there's an allegory here. The bush that blazes unharmed teaches the mystery of the virgin birth. For the light of divinity within the virgin was born to a human life without withering the blossom of her virginity. I like that. True mystic. I would have never gone there, but thank you, uh, St. Gregory, for offering up. This. I claim it. So it was burning but not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. Then he said, Do not come near. Put off your shoes from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. So God appeared there because it was holy ground. Right? Remember I told you last week sometimes places are called holy or sacred because in advance they knew what was going to happen there. I always say this is holy ground because that's where God is. Okay? You're standing on holy ground. I'm right here. Where's this holy ground? And he says, I am the God of your father. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I've come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me, and I've seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Great news so far. Moses is liking it, I suspect. Sounds good. Sounds good. Then he says, come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. What? Thanks for telling me what you're about to go do. But what did you just say? Come again, Come again right. Whoa, 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 whoa. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? Is he just being humble? No, he's saying, I'm not qualified. Plus, I'm afraid, right? I wasn't even brought up a good Jew, right? The, fa the Egyptians don't like me. The Jews don't like me. Right? You got, you got the wrong guy. God offers the remedy. The answer that all he needed. And then I want us to talk, take this person. He says, but I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you. That I have sent. I have sent you. I have sent you. That's all you need. And when you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. The argument's going to go on a little bit. God's going to win. But can you see any personal relevance to this discussion? Have you ever felt like the Lord wanted you to do something that you said, I can't do it. I don't want to do it. <sighs> It sounds too hard for me. I'm not qualified. Might even try. I'm not worthy. How am I going to make this happen? And God says, I'll be with you. And that's enough. Is this speaking to you? It speaks to me. It speaks to me. I feel Moses' pain right here. He might have been talking to himself, why did I bring the sheep up to this mountain? <laughs> that mountain over there was perfectly fine. Lots of grass. And no, old Moses boy has to bring him up here. And I have to approach and look at this burning bush. 
Then Moses said to God, If I come to the house of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, they ask, What is his name? What is his name? Is he just trying another excuse to get away? Or is that a legit question? Do you think that's what the Israelites would have asked? Maybe so. Maybe the Israelites already know his name. I know in Genesis, I think God reveals his name to a grandson or a great-grandson of Adam. I don't remember his name right off. So it could be in their tradition, maybe. They know what his name is. And Moses doesn't. Maybe that's always kind of bothered him. I'm not only a good, not a good Jew, I don't even know God's name. So maybe that's... I don't even know your name. Or maybe they're going to want to know, maybe all the Israelites wanted to know God's name. We're here being different from the Egyptians. They have tons of gods and they all have a name. And we worship a God we don't even know his name. So maybe they said, okay, we're going to, we're going to follow you because God told you, who is he? God answers. Say to Moses, I am who I am. Let's talk about that in a minute. We'll be done for today. I am who I am. In the oldest manuscripts, that's written as a, tent, a tetrometron, I think it's called. I don't know. It means four letters. And it would have been Y-H-V-H in the Hebrew alphabet. In my, in my Tanakh that I looked at, it had the word spelled out. I wish I brought it. I can't read it. I mean, talk about it in the ancient letters, but there's something so beautiful. I don't, not just symmetrical. Something just right about those letters sitting there. I don't, I don't know. But anyway, Y-H, V-H originally, but they, they said the V sounded like a W, so they would have said it as yod he Vav he, or Yod he, Wav he. Yod he, Wav he. In common language, that would have come out Yahweh. Yahweh. Okay? Later Hebrews, not wanting to say that out loud, especially after the, the second temple was built, they would, they would say the, the, the Shema, which means the great name. Or they would say Adonai, which means the Lord. In Greek, that would have been Kyrios, or Kyrie, the Lord. Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy. Right, because they just would not have wanted to say that name. And also, I think, when they were transcribing the scriptures, I've been told that there would be a ceremonial washing after each letter as they wrote it down. Just trying to treat the name of God with such reverence. Don't say it with my, you know, my, my mouth, or my voice, my breath. And when I write it, to treat it with all the reverence it deserves. That beautiful word that I, I saw in the Tanakh. But it's Yahweh. And it means I am who am. I am the one who was there before anything was. I am the one who will be there after everything else isn't. And I'm always currently now. Sounds a lot like Jesus saying I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The one who was, who is, and is to come. Same kind of thing, isn't it? But what, what he's trying to say, when you tell the Israelites my name, it's not like a name of the pagan gods, the, the demons that they worship as a god, or the, the false idols that are just empty carvings that they say are gods. No. I'm above and beyond all of that. I don't have a name you can easily understand. I'm giving you my name, but in it is all the mystery that it should have that st still leaves you wondering, who is this God whose name I can't contain in my brain? What does that mean? I am who have always been am, who is am now, and who will always be am. Think about that and give me the answer next week. <laughs> Let's finish now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for these beautiful mysteries, Lord. Thank you so much. We're not going to come up with easy answers for most of these puzzles, but I hope it at least, Lord, impresses on us 
the depth and the beauty and the mystery, which is you. And we just ask you, Lord, to just help us to abandon ourselves to it, to be consumed by it, the beauty and the power and the grace that you have revealed to mankind, which is a portion of your eternal self. If we can do that, we'll be well nourished in our spirits and minds this week. I ask that you make it happen in Christ's holy name. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.